councils of government, we must car- guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. What we have done in South Vietnam, not only has the psychology changed there, but also it has had a most beneficial effect, in my opinion. before, and I quote again, Mr. Jefferson, that if we expect a nation to be ignorant and free, we expect it never was and never will be. Our intelligence forces brought in their reports warning that if the election called for by the Geneva Accords for July 1956 were held, Ho Chi Minh would be elected president in South Vietnam by at least 80% of the vote. And a hell of They're war. They're the ones who have to win it or lose it. We can help them, we can give them equipment, we can send our men out there as advisors, but they have to win it, the people of Vietnam. How we can uh, bring Americans out of there. Now that is our object, bring Americans home. Any speed up in the withdrawals from Vietnam and well, as you know, uh, when Secretary McNamara and General Taylor came back, they announced that we would expect to withdraw a thousand men from uh, South Vietnam before the end of the year. Kennedy announced we were going to pull out all of our military advisors by the end of 65. We're going to take a thousand out at the end of 63. And we did. The way that struck people who were leaning toward the profits and the benefits of the Vietnam War was really unimaginable. You can't imagine. So... documentary on that Senate race is presented to you by Alaskans for Mike Gravel. For many months, there's been speculation I might seek public office this year. Today, I wish to put an end to the speculation and announce that I'm a candidate for the United States Senate. Every candidate for high office comes to a moment of truth 
when he must choose between sentiment and reality, between the easy path of getting along and going along, and the more difficult route of standing straight and saying he feels nothing to be done. For Mike Gravel, the road to public office started on Chestnut Street in Springfield, Massachusetts. When he became a builder years later, he was following the example of his father, who bucked the hard times of the 1930s as a small painting contractor. Theirs was near an old area called Hungry Hill. Here, politics was an entertainment everyone could afford, and Mike's first job was passing out political handbills. His first try for office, a race for class president in high school, where he won a close race. Mission of a government frozen... When FDR came to town, the hungry hills of America turned out. <laughs> to the young men of the time, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was what the idea of political leadership was all about. To some generation, much is given of other generations much is expected. This generation of Americans has a rendezvous with destiny. Mike had a stay at nearby American International College. There was the usual 20th century interruption. He had started out as a private until the Army found out he had learned fluent French from his parents. Then it was OCS, Paris, Hamburg, Berlin. In the years when the nation began to sense that its responsibilities extended all the way east to the Brandenburg Gate. He was among those for whom the Cold War was the people who lived it, who desperately wanted out, for whom the line between East and West was a tangible fence that ran the length of a continent. He saw the fence and the people firsthand. He wore the plain clothes and heavy shades of an undercover agent, grew mustaches of various sizes, he once walked the streets of Stuttgart with $25,000 cash American for transferring to the underground apparatus. If he looked like an American edition of James Bond, the jokes would come years afterward. The hard line between East and West left a different kind of memory that shapes the opinions he expresses today. I personally see no difference between spending American dollars to defend West Berlin with an airlift as opposed to spending those same dollars in South Vietnam. And I see no difference that if East Berlin invaded West Berlin, and mind you, that country was partitioned after the Second World War, just like North and South Vietnam were partitioned. And they may not like the partitioning, nor do the Germans like the partitioning. What would be the American reaction? I think they'd, they'd gladly go to the defense of West Germany. And I think we should apply the same rule to Asians made a race for the State House of Representatives in 1958 and lost by a country mile. He tried again in 1962 and was a winner. He discovered he not only had the gift for making things happen, but over the years he had developed a natural talent for persuasion. Bruce Kendall was a Republican Speaker of the House when Mike showed up as a youthful member of the legislature. His, mo his, his overriding effectiveness is the fact that he's always better prepared than anyone else on any given subject. Uh, it was very hard to ever uh, badger him into a corner because uh, he had the subject well researched. I am reluctant to make any statement which may be misinterpreted as unappreciative of the gallant French struggle of Bien Bien Phu and elsewhere. But the speeches of President Eisenhower and Secretary Dulles and others have left too much unsaid. 
For if the American people are, for the fourth time in this century, to travel the long and tortuous road of war, particularly a war which we now realize would threaten the survival of civilization, then I believe we have a right to inquire in detail into the nature of the struggle in which we may become engaged. Certainly, I for one favor a policy of united action by many nations whenever necessary to achieve a military and political victory for the free world in that area, realizing full well that it may require some commitment of manpower. But to pour money, material, and men into the jungles of Indochina without at least a remote prospect of victory would be dangerously futile and self-destructive. Of course, all discussions of united action assume the inevitability of such victory. But such assumptions are not unlike similar predictions of confidence which have lulled the American people for many years. I am frankly of the belief that no amount of American military assistance in Indochina can conquer an enemy which is everywhere and at the same time nowhere an enemy of the people which has the sympathy and covert support of the people. If the French persist in their refusal to grant the legitimate independence and freedom desired by the peoples of the associated states, and if those peoples and the other peoples of Asia remain aloof from the conflict as they have in the past, then it is my hope that Secretary Dulles will recognize the futility of channeling American men and machines into that hopeless struggle. I think perhaps if we go over to the map here, I can indicate to you why it is so vitally important. Here is Indochina. If Indochina falls, Thailand is put in an almost impossible position. Nixon becomes one of the first hawks to warn of the domino effect of communist aggression. That indicates to you and to all of us why it is vitally important that Indochina not go behind the Iron Curtain. Nixon is one of the first to favor military intervention, but President Eisenhower won't commit troops to a ground war in Asia. Nixon supports the use of tactical nuclear weapons, but Ike says the sun is still shining. Dien Bien Phu isn't the end of the world. If Indochina goes, several things happen right away. Uh, the Crop Peninsula, the last little bit of end hanging on down there would be scarcely defensible. The tin and the tungsten that we so greatly value from that area would cease coming. The letters and the reports we had on Ho Chi Minh's attitude back in 1946. He wrote, I think it was seven letters to this government and received no reply. The, 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 the pathos almost, the, uh, the, the sadness that here's a man who felt and believed the United States would be sympathetic to his purpose of gaining his independence from a colonial power. And then to find we, you know, he, he, this is what he'd read, he'd been here, he'd read our Constitution and our Declaration of Independence. He thought, surely the United States would be interested. We had testimony in the committee that his one worry was that it was so insignificant. Vietnam was so far away and so insignificant, we, we, we would never bother about it. It's too, too small for, to ever attract the attention of the United States. He was sure in his own mind that if we would ever put our minds and focus upon it, we would be for him how different history would have been for us and for them if we had felt a common interest in a colonial province like Vietnam seeking its independence of France. I was the chief of special operations in the joint staff, working for the joint chiefs of staff. Special operations in those days was a euphemism for the military support of the clandestine operations of CIA around the world. Prouty was an insider who claimed that while some in the Pentagon were gearing up for war, he was secretly helping President Kennedy plan for peace. Well, during the summer, July, August, and September, he had a very experienced group of people work on his new policy for Vietnam. It was published in October, and it was called the National Security Action Memorandum Number 263. And that memorandum signed under the direction of the president was to bring men home by Christmas and get everybody out by 1965.
their the, the way they look, they look determined and, and, and reverent at the same time, but still they're a bloody good bunch of killers. When our intelligence forces brought in their reports warning that if the election called for by the Geneva Accords for July 1956 were held, Ho Chi Minh would be elected president in South Vietnam by at least 80% of the vote. I had a hell of a time with Morris this morning. He insisted that our PT, that our destroyers were there to back up. He said that on television last night. He said that, uh, he said... There is a feeling, therefore, that this uh, harassment attack and this attack with uh, 20 or more torpedoes upon two of our uh, uh, destroyers was designed to uh, uh, force us out in a way lest we precipitate a greater struggle. I have a feeling that they've misread America once again. Uh, because of the fact that so much of our economy is geared uh, in the military area, there is grave danger of uh, a military uh, industrial alliance of a kind uh, actually affecting policy. Mr. Nixon has participated in since you've been in the White House, and he, as Vice President, has been helping you. I just wondered if you could give us an example of a major idea of his that you had adopted in that role as the as the decider and uh, and final. Uh... If you give me a week, I might think of one. Senator Gravel a chance. Senator Gravel, I've listened to you very carefully in this campaign. You were in the Senate. You're one of the few in the Senate. You were in the Senate, and you take credit for stopping the draft. If you were a senator right now, what advice would you give your colleagues still in Congress about how they can stop the war, even though they don't have enough votes to stop a debate or to override a veto? What should they do? Well, the first thing, you stop the debate by voting every single day on cloture. Every day, 20 days, and you'll overcome cloture. The president vetoes the law. It comes back to the Congress, and in the House at noon, every single day, you vote to override the president's veto. And in 40 days, the American people will have weighed in, put the pressure on those. You tell me that the, the votes aren't there, you go get them by the scruff of the neck. That's what you do. And uh, Tim, you're, you're really missing something. This is fantasy land. We're talking about ending the war before I had a chance to stand with them a couple, three times. It's like going into the Senate. You know, the first time you get there, you're all excited. My God, how did I ever get here? Then about six months later, you say, how the hell did the rest of them get here? <laughs> and, and I gotta tell you, after standing up with them, some of these people frighten me. They frighten me. When, when you have mainline candidates that turn around and say that there's nothing off the table with respect to Iran, that's code for using nukes, nuclear devices. I gotta tell you, I'm President of the United States. There will be no preemptive wars with nuclear devices. To my mind, it's immoral, and it's been immoral for the last 50 years as part of American foreign policy. What's you? Joe, I'll include you, too. You have a certain arrogance. You want to you wanna tell the Iraqis how to run their country. I got to tell you, we should just play get out. Just play get out. It's their country. They're asking us to leave, and we insist on staying there. And why not get out? You know what's worse than a soldier dying in vain? is more soldiers dying in vain. That's what Bye. I would not endorse either one of them. They're both for the continuation of the war in Iraq, and two, they're both sustaining American imperialism and the military-industrial complex that goes along with it. We need to change our imperialistic policies. We need to act like we're part of the world and not leading the world and bullying the world with our excessive power, military power. So let's maybe bring up the topic of the day, which is the Green New Deal. How much will this cost? That's unclear. How will we pay for it? Unknown. It's not realistic. Because there's no way to pay for it. It's immoral. The younger generation now tells me how tough things are. Give me a break. No, no. I have no empathy. I'm guided by the beauty of our weapons. I think Medicare for all is one of the possible paths. 
So I decided I was going to start prosecuting parents for truancy. This was a little controversial in San Francisco. <laughs> he did ask you yes or no. Would you support no. free college for all? I am not for free four-year college for all, no. Human beings are being killed as I speak to you tonight, killed as a direct result of policy decisions we as a body have made. This approach of war on drugs has not succeeded. We've spent billions of dollars on it. And we fill up our prisons to the point where we're the embarrassment of the world. We're supposed to be a democracy. We've got more people in prison to the point million people in prison. We spend more as a nation on defense than all the rest of the world put together. This whole nation should be a sanctuary for the world. I'm ashamed as an American to be building a fence on our southern border. That's not the America that I fought for. Our soldiers died in Vietnam in vain. You can now, John, go to Hanoi and get a Baskin Robbins ice cream cone. Why do they hate us so in so many places around the world? Because we kill so many people wantonly. Oh, Joe, I'll include you too. You have a certain arrogance. You want to you wanna tell the Iraqis how to run their country. And we can get off of gasoline in five years, and we can get off of carbon in 10 years. All we got to do is want to do it. Just play, get out. It's their country. They're asking us to leave, and we insist on staying there. The military industrial complex not only controls our government, lock, stock, and barrel, but they control our culture. And it would be a great adventure to put forth all of the effort and ability that I might have to return to that honor by trying to make a contribution that will last beyond my immediate lifetime.